Today I want to discuss how general relativity affects photons. And this is follow up to several other videos I'm doing on general relativity theory. And in particular, we need to understand how the three basic proofs of general relativity involving photons happen. And those proofs are photon redshift or blue shift, depending on which way the photon's going, light slowing, and light bending. So first, to understand the interaction, we need to understand how photons interact with the quantum field. And to begin with, the basic model we have for the quantum field is it's made of particle pair dipoles. These are quantum fluctuations in our particle pairs, like electron-positron pairs, usually matter-antimatter pairs. They can also be proton-antiproton pairs, and potentially any other real particles you want to imagine, as long as they're real. And what happens between these dipoles is you get van der Waals forces. So, so quantum fluctuations produce van der Waals forces and van der Waals torque. And we know that there are van der Waals forces because that's confirmed by the, the Casimir effect. In the Casimir effect, two plates can be pushed together by van der Waals forces within the quantum field. And they're pushed together because some particle pairs with longer wavelengths are excluded in the region of space between them because they're too big. So from the Casimir effect, we know that there are van der Waals forces, which confirms the particle pair dipole model of the quantum field that's part of the standard model. But there's also van der Waals torques, because whenever you have a sea of electric charge dipoles and you have a charge moving, those dipoles rotate, causing other dipoles to rotate, causing other dipoles to rotate. But it takes energy for those dipoles to rotate. They all resist rotation. And so you have this regulating mechanism that regulates rotation of the dipoles, which regulates polarization when electric fields form, and magnetization when magnetic fields form, and the electric constant permittivity and magnetic constant permeability arise from the quantum field because of the restrictions on and regulation of the uh, rotation due to van der Waals torque. Now many physicists don't talk about van der Waals torque in the quantum field, but in electrochemistry it's, it's quite common. It's, it's important and it's recognized as being important. And it's just as important as physics. We, as physicists we can't ignore a fundamental electric charge interaction uh, just because we haven't thought about it before. Van der Waals torques are going to exist in a sea of dipoles. Van der Waals torque regulates dimensions and clock rates because they regulate the wavelengths and frequencies of the quantum fluctuations themselves. So not only does it regulate the motion of bodies, it regulates the whole quantum field, which is how dimensions and clock rates emerge. And since general relativity and special relativity start with dimensions and clock rates, you have to start with the quantum field. You have to start with the van der Waals torque of the quantum field, because that gives us the wavelengths and frequencies which determine dimensions and clock rates locally. Now, what makes general relativity happen is D, that van der Waals torque increases near matter. Now this is a phenomenon that's also related to inertia. When an electrical neutral body moves through space, it's limited by the speed of light. Well, the speed of light squared is related to the permittivity and permeability. So the speed of light limit on electrically neutral bodies is due to electrical 
interactions and the van der Waals torque in the quantum field. So not only does the van der Waals torque produce the limits for electrically charged bodies and light itself, it also gives the speed of light to electrically neutral bodies, which tells us that inertia is electrical in nature. It also tells us that electrically neutral bodies, when they're just sitting in space, are interacting with the quantum dipoles of space. And as such, they increase the local van der Waals torque. Just like you'd have an apparent increase of torque as a body moves through space and forces the dipoles to rotate and they resist rotation due to the torque, even when they're supposedly at rest in your frame of reference, they're still, their motions resisting, being resisted by the torque or their lack of motions being resisted by the torque of the quantum field. So you have this continual interaction between a stationary body or a moving body and the quantum field that relates to the torque. And the more matter you have, the greater the torque in the vicinity of that, that body of matter. And this is where the general relativistic effects come from. So next we can see that increasing torque on photons causes blue shift. It causes wavelengths to get slower because the photon rotation gets slower. And then, as the torque decreases, you get redshift. And this is where blue shift and redshift come from. And we think about photons as a photon propagates through space. It's, it's oscillating up and down. When it does that, it's producing an electromagnetic field, first one way and then the other, and a rotating electromagnetic field. And the magnetic field is going in the perpendicular direction, perpendicular to the electric field. And it's all rotating. And the way it rotates is indicative of a rotating dipole in the middle. So even though we don't normally think of photons being a rotating dipole, when you're looking at the electrical nature of photons and how it interacts with the quantum field, they behave like they have a quantum particle pair dipole in the middle that rotates one way and then rotates the other way the next half wavelength. And because of that rotation, they're affected by the quantum van der Waals torque so that the rotation gets slowed and which changes the wavelength. So as a photon propagates through space, when it approaches a body of matter, you get blue shift if it's coming toward the matter, and if it's going away from the matter, you get redshift. And this is where we get the so-called gravitational redshift, which isn't gravitational at all. It's purely electromagnetic, and it's caused by the changing van der Waals torque as you get closer to a body of matter like our sun or another star. And so this mechanism is actually quite simple. And then to go on to the next one, increasing torque slows clock rates as well. And we know that from GPS clocks, that the further away from Earth you get, the faster your clocks run. And when they get closer to Earth again, they slow down. And we can we can measure the, that even at smaller distances in experiments. So this has the effect of having an additional slowing on light. The clock rate slowing, which is due to the van der Waals torque, slows the frequency. So light, even though from the perspective of the photon, the photon doesn't really know that its frequency is reduced, that it's getting fewer cycles per second because of the 
on a van der Waals torque. It does. And so that's an additional slowing effect that relates to the slowing of light. So in terms of the proofs of general relativity like the Shapiro delay, where the slowing of light is known to have two components, one that's related to the wavelength changing and the other to the frequency slowing, the clock rate changing. So you get both blue shift as a photon approaches the sun, which is the changing of the wavelength. You also get the clock rate slowing, the changing of slowing of the frequency. And then as it goes past the sun, you get red shifting again. And assuming the characteristics are the same on either side, you end up with the same uh, velocity, frequency, and wavelength at the, at the end. So the light slowing is all basic optics. Once again, it's a purely electrical interaction that has nothing to do with uh, gravity itself, per se. It's just an effect of the increasing van der Waals torque near a body of matter. Now the last effect is bending of light. In, in most basic optics, we have Snell's law um, that light bends when the speed of light changes. And so if you have a piece of glass, for example, and light's coming in at an angle, it will bend because light slows inside the glass. And we can get the relationship of the sine theta of the angles to is based on the amount of light slowing. So when we have light slowing, as a photon approaches near a star, it will cause bending. And this is just basic index of refraction. And the index of refraction is the speed of light um, in a vacuum over the speed of light in the material. In this case, the material, though, is the quantum field near a sun. And the speed of light in the vacuum is the speed of light far away from the sun. Although when we deal with special relativity, there's always matter involved. Even though it's maybe not close, there's some effects, some small effects going on because of the distribution of all matter in space. You can think of it as a Machian effect of, of the distribution of all the matter in relation to where you're located. So that's how we end up with bending. And we know um, from the work Einstein did that the angle theta is equal to 4 g m over r c squared, where g is the gravitational constant, m is the mass of the body, and then r is the radius where the closest approach radius of the photon, and c squared is, of course, the speed of light. And in place of C squared, we can actually substitute the permittivity and permeability constant. Because C squared is, uh, is equal to 1 over the permittivity times permeability. So we could really change this to theta equals GM permittivity permeability, which gives you a better sense that what we're talking about here is an electromagnetic phenomena. And so we can also put the index refraction term in terms of permittivity and permeability, where the permittivity and permeability of space increase due to the increasing quantum van der Waals torque near a star. And so what we have of the, the theta, the bending angle, is half is due to the, the blue shifting, the change in wavelength, and half is due to the change in clock rate, or change in frequency. So 2gm over rc squared for both of those. So we have um, a case where that's purely electromagnetic, 
And interestingly, Einstein actually derived the idea that if you change the dielectric constant in space due to matter, you could account for the bending of light due to the, uh, the effect on the wavelength, the length contraction. But what Einstein forgot to do is that is consider both link contraction and clock slot when he was looking at an electromagnetic theory of general relativity in the 1907 to 1912 time frame. So Einstein was this close to doing general relativity properly and he screwed it up. Uh, he decided that the speed of light had to be constant rather than variable while electromagnetic general relativity, the speed of light varies. And so when you're dealing with light bending, say in this case, you're dealing with the actual wavelength contraction being a real shortening of the wavelength of the photon and not a shortening of the space. Just like the frequency slowing is not a time dilation of the space, of non-physical space, it's a real slowing of the frequency of the clock rate. So while it uh, is a slightly different way of looking at it, electromagnetic general relativity gives you exactly the same results. And so this tells us that general relativity is a purely electromagnetic effect. And that relates to dimensions and clock rates. And that's all we need. All we need to do is think about what's going on with the van der Waals torque and its effect on the permittivity and permeability and the rotation of the photons. And that gives us the three main proofs of general relativity related to photons. The blue shift and red shift, the light slowing, and light bending. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, I'll link to a couple papers and, and, related, um, and related videos below. And also, I plan to do other videos on what happens with the planet Mercury, the precession of Mercury problem, because that's slightly different, and I, so I want to split these up. But I hope you enjoyed it, and please share it with your physicist friends, and subscribe if you want to see more videos. And if you want to read about this, I talk about this in my book, The Zero Point Universe, and that's available for sale on Amazon. And I also talk about it a little bit in my other two books, The Hunter Greatest Lies in Physics, and my particle theory book, Goodbye Quarks, The Onion Theory. And I'm a retired independent researcher now, and so if you'd like to support me in my retirement, buying a book helps with that, or you can contribute to my Patreon account, and that would be much appreciated. So, thanks for watching.